Uh, thank you, dear brother. That's Mount Moriah Baptist Church, Powhatan, Virginia. We'll celebrate 170 years this August. Now, I get asked sometimes, but I am not the founding pastor. <laughs> It is truly a privilege to be here with you. Thank you again, Pastor, for this invitation. Uh, we have been praying. My wife has been praying uh, with me. And uh, we are thankful uh, to have this privilege to focus on prayer. I would ask you to turn in your Bible to three passages of Scripture as we begin this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5. First Samuel 12 and Luke 1. This is my help meet, my better half. The Lord has allowed us to be married and serve Him in full-time ministry for 38 and a half years. We've been at Mount Moriah 17 and a half, served as a youth pastor and music director for the first six years of our ministry. The Lord has allowed us to serve as a senior pastor in Maryland and then in Memphis. Spent five and a half years in California planting a church and uh, then came to Powhatan in 2003. The Lord has blessed us with four living children, and one in heaven. She only lived 25 hours. I may share that with you a little bit later uh, this week. But our oldest is Tommy, standing there beside me. He is a a CPA and a financial planner, owns his own company in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is the music director and the choir director for Graceway Baptist Church, Pastor Chris Edwards, uh, there in the, the Charlotte area. The one right in front of him is our cosmetologist daughter, as you can tell from her hair. <laughs> By the way, Tommy has five boys, nine, seven, five, and identical twins that are three. Christina came home from cosmetology school and she, after she got married and she put some color in her hair and she said, Daddy, this is what I do. I'm a cosmetologist. I said, Christina, I don't like it. I'm a daddy and that's what I do. <laughs> but I said, you're married now and that's your son's issue or your husband's issue, I mean. She has two daughters, 11 and 9, and she's expecting another baby in uh, May. The young lady beside her there is, of course, my bride. And then the next one there right in front of me is Kimberly. Uh, she is, uh, lives near us. She has four girls. Her oldest will be 17 on Wednesday. And then uh, 10, 7, and 5. And she's one of the girls who's taking care of Mama uh, right now. And then Rachel is our baby and uh, lives in Virginia Beach, has two boys, and uh, she has come to stay with Mama uh, this week. So we have 13 grandchildren, number 14 on the way. They were all at our house at Christmas time, and that's when we got these pictures. And by the way, we did not sing Silent Night uh, in any time uh, while they were there. Uh, it was a, 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 a blessed time. I do thank you for praying for my wife. Uh, she had a complete knee replacement this Wednesday. Uh, by God's grace, she came home Thursday. Matter of fact, the doctor came in to see her Thursday, and, and she said, Oh, I just love you. I'm feeling so much better. And he said, Wait till tomorrow. <laughs> by the time we got her home, the nerve block wore off. And uh, she had a real bad night Thursday night and a bad Friday morning. Uh, physical therapy came on Friday and uh, has begun that, pro that recovery process. The doctor told her, the first two weeks, you will hate me. So when you come in for your six-week checkup, you'll be tolerating me. And when you come in for your three-month checkup, you will bring me gifts. <laughs> and um, so we're anticipating uh, that uh, for God's uh, glory. Uh, she is an incredible helpmeet. Matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was on the phone with your pastor, and she was in the car. We had her on speakerphone, and he said to her, if you want your husband to stay at home, you just say so, and we will make adjustments. 
but uh, she insisted that I come, and she said, the daughters can take care of me. Matter of fact, she probably thinks they're better caregivers than I am. Um, you know, us men don't have very much tolerance for pain uh, like our wives do. She's always been the caregiver. I've had six back surgeries. I've had a uh, gallbladder out. I've had hepatitis. I've had valley fever. I've had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And so she's always been taking care of me. Now the role's reversed. And, and she said to me the other day, she said, Honey, my biggest fear is how I'm going to handle the pain. I said, sweetheart, you're going to handle the pain with the same grace that you've handled everything else uh, in our lives. And she is. But thank you uh, for praying uh, for her. She is praying for us uh, this morning uh, as, as well. As I mentioned in the Sunday school hour this morning, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor teacher. And what we want to try to do this week is really share with you some of what God has been doing in my life about five years ago, I met Dr. Harold Vaughn. Uh, if some of you know Dr. Vaughn, he travels the country having prayer summits, prayer advances. We don't call them prayer retreats. We're advancing. We're not retreating. So prayer advances and prayer summits in churches. And back in uh, last January, some men and I went to the men's prayer advance. Mark, some ladies, and my wife went to ladies' prayer advance. And then in October, Dr. Vaughn came and we had a Friday, Saturday, Sunday prayer summit. Where we just focused totally uh, on prayer. And, and much of what I will share with you uh, this week are things that I have learned in this process of growing in my own prayer life. As I said in Sunday school, I am not the expert on prayer. I'm not a prayer guru. I'm just a servant of the Lord who wants to share with you what God is teaching me and how he is growing me. And if that can help you in your walk with him, then that'll be a real blessing. Our theme as a church last year was pray, was living in the light of eternity. Part of that was praying in the light of eternity. And our vision is that we would learn this week that prayer that honors God is prayer that is God-focused, Scripture-driven, Spirit-led and faith-filled. The Lord has laid on my heart this morning uh, the, the burden. I want to share with you what I believe is the most powerful and yet the most neglected resource that is available to you and me. God is a God who delights in hearing our prayer. He is a God who delights in answering prayer. He is a God who has made it possible for us to have access to His power through prayer. And yet so often we neglect to pray. Notice these three verses. Would you stand with me in respect for God's Word uh, this morning? Again, as I said in the Sunday School Hour, the greatest need of America is for revival of God's people. Notice 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. You probably can quote this with me, can't you? Pray without ceasing. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke, cha I'm sorry, Luke 11, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying, Christ was praying, in a certain place, we come to understand that's probably the Garden of Gethsemane where he went the night before he was crucified. When he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, let me ask you a question, how many disciples did he have following him regularly? Twelve. twelve. One of them. I wonder why all twelve didn't. But one, and maybe it's Peter, we don't know for sure, but he was sort of the spokesman, wasn't he? One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel 12, I'm sorry. I'm so full this morning, my mind is just uh, running, running wild. 1 Samuel chapter 12. By the way, it's interesting that the disciple did not say, teach us how to pray. He said, teach us to pray. I'll be the, the, I believe the very words of Scripture are important. 
1 Samuel chapter 12, look at verse 23. Samuel the prophet is speaking and says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against you in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his infallible word. One songwriter said, what the world needs most is love, sweet love. But I contend this morning what the world needs most is prayer, sweet prayer. God's people learning to communicate with God that we may have power, learning to pray fervently, specifically, effectually, and passionately. For God's glory. Let's ask the Holy Spirit of God to help us, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we have shared together already this morning. Lord, the music, boy, has just stirred my heart. Thank you that we serve an almighty, unchangeable God. Thank you that you reveal the Lamb for us. Thank you that we've been encouraged to consider Him Thank you that you love every one of us with that unconditional, unchanging love. Lord, now we come to the communication of your word. I pray that you would help me to be emptied of self and filled with your spirit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't really have an outline for you this morning. Just really some questions to ask and try to answer them with God's truth uh, to to stir us and to challenge us uh, this morning. I believe with all of my heart that prayer is the most powerful but most neglected resource that you and I have. What's the greatest sin that a Christian commits? If you were to be honest and you were in the privacy of your own home, write down a list of your sins from 2019 or maybe already from 2020. What would they be? So I want to ask the question, first of all, what's the Christian's greatest sin? Back in 1912, a group of preachers got together in South Africa. They asked that same question and they wrote this. If only we study the conditions in all sincerity, we shall have to acknowledge that our unbelief and sin are the cause of the lack of spiritual power. That this condition is one of sin and guilt before God and nothing less than a direct grieving of the Holy Spirit of God. Their conclusion was that the greatest sin that a Christian commits is the sin of prayerlessness. That was 1912, over 100 years ago. I wonder what they'd say today. You know, you you, you look at the researchers about the average amount of time that a believer spends in prayer. And you can find different numbers and different studies, but all of them conclude that it's simply a matter of minutes every day. Matter of fact, Christianity Today a few years ago did a study of pastors, a thousand pastors, and asked, how much time do you spend every day in prayer? And the average pastor said he spends less than five minutes a day in prayer. No reason we have no power. No, 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 no question. We have no power in our churches because there is no prayer. Is this sin really that bad, you may say? Well, they, this group in 1912 continued, we were gradually led to the sin of prayerlessness. It's one of the deepest roots of the evil. Nothing so reveals the defective spiritual nature in preacher and congregation as the lack of believing and unceasing prayer. Prayer is indeed the impulse of the spiritual life. Persevering and believing prayer means a strong and abundant life. Andrew Murray said it is only the prayerless who are too proud to own up to their prayerlessness. But what is prayerlessness? 
Is it really sin? And if so, what makes it sin? Well, someone has defined prayerlessness as not using or not availing ourselves of prayer or habitually neglecting prayer or being simply without prayer. What, what does the Scripture say? That's our authority. Well, I went back to the book of Job, Job chapter 15, Eliphaz said to Job, Yea, thou castest off fear and restrainest prayer before God. Job answers by describing what a truly wicked man looks like, and he says in Job 21, 14, and 15, Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray to him? So in other words, he says, The wicked man is a man who says, What difference does it make? Now, many of us as believers would never verbalize that. But we practice it. We talk about prayer. We sing about prayer. We agree that it's important. But we don't pray as we ought. Psalm 14, 4, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? Psalm 53, verse 4, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge. He basically repeats the same thing. Isaiah the prophet said it this way, but we are all of it as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away and there is none that calleth upon thy name that stir up himself to take hold of thee for thou hast hid thy face from us and has consumed us because of our Iniquities. One preacher wrote this, the worst sin is prayerlessness. Overt sin or crime or the glaring inconsistencies which often surprise us in Christian people are the effect of prayerlessness. Now think about what he said here. We see believers that get trapped in what we would consider a horrendous sin. Okay? And we say, oh, wow, how could that happen? We read about preachers who get caught in ungodliness, immorality. And we say, how can that happen? This author said, it's the result of prayerlessness. You cannot be committed to effectual, fervent prayer and live in sin simultaneously. We're going to talk tonight about what the Bible calls the clean cleansing protocol. Prayerlessness is that state when we pray less than we ought to pray, less than the Heavenly Father desires us to pray, less than we know we should pray. Communication with the Father. The dearth of prayer means the dearth of power. The death of prayer means the death of power. No prayer, no power. Ezekiel 37 describes a time when God instructed the prophet to preach to a valley of dry bones. Interesting. When he obeyed God, the Word of God and the Spirit of God stirred those dry bones and they came together and they were made alive. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. They came alive. Why? Through the preaching of the Word of God and obedience to what God told his servant. Some of us are spiritually dry. Our churches are filled with spiritually dry bones. We need the Spirit of God and the Word of God to make us alive again. And that's really what revival is. When it makes us alive again, that begins when we humble ourselves and pray. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, Prayerlessness is saying, I'm too busy for God. Prayerlessness is walking in the dark 
blindfolded. Prayerlessness is the fool saying in his heart, there is no God. And again, we would not utter those words, but by our lives, we practice them. Prayerlessness is wasting time that you think you're saving. Prayerlessness is seeing only with natural eyes. Prayerlessness is the absence of God's power. Prayerlessness is disobedience. Prayerlessness is the first step toward the church of Ichabod. The glory has departed. Prayerlessness is presuming upon God's grace and God's mercy. Prayerlessness is like a car with no gas. Many of you probably have heard of the Rose Bowl Parade. I grew up in a home where my mother, bless her, made us watch the Rose Bowl Parade on New Year's Day before we could watch football. Oh, oh, horrendous for a young man. After we were married, we're visiting in California. We're in a church, First Baptist, uh, there in Santa Maria. And uh, Brother Jim Shetler was a pastor there then. And Brother Shetler said, I'm going to the Rose Bowl Parade Tuesday. Anybody want to go? And my wife goes, boom! He said, meet me down front. And so we met him down front. And guess where I went? Rose Bowl Parade. There was one year the Rose Bowl Parade had a float by Standard Oil. You know, the energy company, the gas company. In the middle of the Rose Bowl Parade, their float stopped dead in the street. Come to find out, somebody had failed to put gas in the vehicle. They had all the gas they needed, and they didn't put it in the tank. Prayerlessness is like us trying to navigate life without the power that God has made available. Prayerlessness is trusting in your own strength. Prayerlessness is preferring my way to God's way. Prayerlessness is wanting to eat without preparing the meal without going through the spirit, the disciplines. Prayerlessness is doing things for God that he never asked us to do because we thought it was a good idea, but forgot to ask him. Prayerlessness is living for the praises of men instead of the praise of God. Prayerlessness is going into battle without your armor on. Part of the armor of God is praying. Prayerlessness, let's just be honest, prayerlessness is laziness. Prayerlessness is giving into the flesh. Prayerlessness is faithlessness. Remember those words of Samuel, God forbid that I should do what? Sin against you in ceasing to pray. The Bible says prayerlessness is sin. Why? Why? Because prayerlessness does those around us a disservice. As part of the family of God, we have the privilege of praying for one another, of interceding for one another. And when we are prayerless, we're hurting others in the body because we're not doing that. Prayerlessness is disobedience. Prayerlessness demonstrates an attitude that I, of independence. I've got this. Some of my grandchildren were at the house last night, and one of them sitting in the chair beside me, and I put my arm around her and I said, Lily, would you please pray for Paul Paul this week? She said, Oh, Paul Paul, you got this. <laughs> I said, No, honey, I don't got this unless the Spirit of God helps me. Amen. And she said, Okay, Paul Paul, I'll pray for you every day. But how many times do we get up and we just go through the routine of life? without even thinking to pray about it. How many times do we get in our car and start it up and head down the road without thinking to ask God to help us as we travel? You know, there are some 
crazy drivers out there. I think everybody on the road is crazy except you and me. I was coming across 10 this morning. It was a place where there was two lanes on each side, and this lady pulled up beside me, and I had my cruise control set, and she pulled up, she backed up. She pulled up, she, she slowed down, uh, this and that. And all of a sudden, she starts just coming right over in my lane. You know, do you think to pray before you go anywhere? Do you think to ask God before you make decisions? So often we say, oh, God's not concerned about... God is concerned about every detail of our life. The Bible says he has the hair on our head numbered. For some, that's not too hard. <laughs> right? The Bible says he keeps our tears in his bottle. Wow. God cares. I, I was going to hospital visitation one time. I was pastoring in Maryland. had one of my deacons with me. I'd only been there about a month. And we pulled in the parking lot. It was pouring down snow and sleet and mess. And I said, Chris, let's pray for God to give us a parking space up close to the door. He looked at me. He said, preacher, God doesn't care about that. I said, Chris, I believe he does. And so I just prayed out loud. We came around, pulled into the parking lot. And right in front of the front door, there was a person backing out and pulling away. And I said, hmm, God doesn't care about that, does he? He looked at me, he said, I'll never say that again. <laughs> God cares. It, but, but when we go through life without talking to him, it demonstrates our independence. It demonstrates our unbelief. Your pastor said it earlier this morning. The only thing that can hinder what God wants to do in our lives <laughs> is our unbelief and our unwillingness to respond to him. They hindered the Holy One of Israel because they believe not. Oh, may God help us to, to believe. It hinders revival. It hinders God's blessing. It proves that God is not first in my life. You cannot serve two masters. Right? That's what God says. And then he says, I want you to trust me. Question number one, what's the Christian's greatest sin? Question number two, what is prayer? Let's just get real foundational. Okay, prayer is the expression of my mind to the Lord. Uh, prayer is nothing else but the expression or offering of those holy and good descriptions to God that arise from the spirit of, an, of a regenerate man in the name of Jesus Christ. I read that D.L. Moody was with a, a group of boys maybe fourth, fifth grade boys, and he asked them, what is prayer? And I love this definition. Look what he said. He said, prayer is offering up our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. A fourth grade boy wrote that. Are you kidding me? It had to be in D.L. Moody's day. Right, yeah, yeah. Right? Prayer is spiritual breathing. Mm -hmm. Prayer ought to be as natural to us as breathing is. It really should. Prayer is communication with God, pouring our heart out to God. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 gives us four words that we know. They have a little different nuance of, of meaning, supplication. Asking for definite needs. Prayers. This is a, a broad, comprehensive approach to God. It has the element of, of devotion, the element of access to God, coming boldly before the throne of grace. Third word he uses is intercessions. Praying for others. Enlarging our prayer circle. Freedom and boldness and faith and confidence to access God. And then the giving of thanks. We're going to talk some more tonight about the giving of thanks. Matter of fact, beginning this evening, what I'd like to give you each service is, is what Dr. Harold Vaughn calls prayer protocols. You know, everything in life has a protocol. If you're going to see the King of England or you're invited to dinner at the White House... There's a different protocol than if you're going with your family down to Wendy's. Right? There's a different protocol when you're meeting uh, somebody at Walmart and when you're meeting royalty. 
So, so we're going to talk about these prayer protocols, how to approach God. We'll look at that, that this evening. We'll talk about this idea of, of giving thanks. I'm so thankful that Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit of God is our helper as we pray. For I know not oft how to pray, but the Holy Spirit of God takes the groanings of our heart and presents them to the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, seated there on the right hand of the Father, is praying for us today. Wow. Well, what a blessing this week. We, we've got a circle of friends and Facebook stuff, and, and we were posting about Alicia, and, and people were commenting, they're praying and asking updates and praising the Lord with us, etc. But you know what? And, and that's wonderful. But the Son of God yeah. is seated there praying for you and me. Yes. There is no better intercessor. Amen. And yet... We fail to avail ourselves of entrance into his presence because we don't pray. Prayer is a privilege and it is a duty. We're commanded to pray. That leads me thirdly and quickly to the final question this morning. What will we do about it? It's one thing to acknowledge it. But what are we going to do about it? I would suggest, first of all, we need to confess it and repent. Agree with God that prayerlessness is sin. Yes. I talk to a lot of people, they say, and, and sometimes they just say, well, I, I, just don't, I just don't have time. I don't take time. Or, and they, they just sort of, it's, it's a little thing. You know, like somebody saying, well, I don't tell black lies, I just tell little white lies. Yeah. You know, I don't commit major sins. Just a little prayerless. It's no big deal. Let me tell you, it's a big deal to God. Yeah. We need to agree with God. And that's really what confession is, agreeing with God. Not making an excuse. Uh, not, not trying to rename it. Yeah. Recategorize it. But agreeing with God says it's sin. The first step in us becoming fervent prayer warriors for God's glory is admitting the sin of prayerlessness. Secondly, understand and agree with God about the power of prayer. Yes. Hopefully, as we meet together, prayerfully as we meet together this week, we will be more convinced of the power of prayer. I am convinced that I can do nothing in this old stinking flesh unless the Holy Spirit of God does empower me. Yes. And the older I get, the more I'm convinced of that. Thirdly, commit yourself to learning the discipline of prayer. Pastor, I'm convinced that sometimes people don't pray because they don't know how, yeah. right? Sometimes we tell people you need to pray, and, and I've had people say, okay, how? And again, I, I'm thankful for godly heritage. Some of you knew my grandmother, Bess Duell. My grandfather on my dad's side was saved in the Billy Sunday revival in Richmond in the early 1900s. He used to tell me he walked the sawdust trail. I'm thankful for that. But every time I went to my grandfather's house, not Granddaddy Duell, but Granddaddy Aldous, the only prayer I ever heard him pray was, Father, thank you for these and all thy many blessings. Amen. I wonder if nobody ever took the time to teach him the discipline of prayer. To teach him how to call upon the name of the Lord, to teach him how in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to make your request known unto God. My burden this week is that we would grow in our understanding of the discipline. And it is a spiritual discipline. You know what the, 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 the nuances of Scripture, the tensions of Scripture, is this is what God has promised he will do. 
But this is what God says I expect you to do. And sometimes we're very good with saying, praise the God for what he's going to do. But we're not willing to do what he's told us to do. This is a discipline. This is a spiritual discipline. This is not something you just put your head on your pillow and by osmosis you learn to pray. I want to encourage you, if you want to be a prayer warrior, to commit yourself to learning. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. They saw that Jesus spent much time with his father. And they said, we want to learn that. And again, they didn't want to learn some methodology. They wanted to learn to pray. And that's what they asked God for. One evangelist said the average Christian does not spend five minutes a day in prayer. And that's why he's average. Luke 18, 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Dr. John R. Rice used to say prayer ought to arise from the heart like the fragrance of burning incense off an altar day and night all the time. He wrote, as a mother in her sleep listens for the cry of her baby, so a Christian's heart can be attuned to God while he's absorbed in daily duties and even when he sleeps. Wednesday night I spent at the hospital in those wonderfully comfortable recliner beds that they give you to sleep in. (laughs) Thursday night I slept in a chair and a half that we have beside my wife's hospital bed at home. And I found myself not able to sleep deeply because I was constantly listening to make sure she was okay. Constantly listening to see if there was groaning, if it was time for her to get up and blah, blah, blah. You know, there there ought to be a sense in our hearts that we're constantly listening to what God is doing, what God is prompting in our lives. That still, small voice. You know, sometimes we're looking for this major event. And God's speaking to us in a still, small voice. Maybe it's a verse you read in your devotions. Maybe it's in passing something a brother or sister says. Maybe it's something that that a pastor says as he's preaching and the Holy Spirit of God says, boom, you need to focus right there. We need to be attentive to that. R.A. Torrey, I love this. He said of that phrase, pray without ceasing. He said the, the Greek word there literally means stretched out at Lee. I don't know if that's a real word. That's what he said. That's what he wrote. He said it's a picturesque word. It represents the soul stretching out in intensity to reach God. Like the the halfback who's handed the ball and, and, and the line doesn't quite get the defense pushed away and he jumps over the pile and he's got the football stretched out trying to get the nose of it over the goal line. Hopefully like the Green Bay Packers are going to do today in, in, in their game. But that stretch, it's like the runner. He's running, and he's running side by side, and Caleb and I are, are in a race, and, and he's winning, and all of a sudden I reach up and I trip him, and he's almost falling, and I reach like this to try to get across the line. That's his picture. When's the last time you were stretched out before God in prayer? We're too casual in our prayer life. Prayerlessness separates us from the presence of God. Prayerless Christians cannot be Christ-like. Prayerless preaching cannot be Holy Spirit anointed. Prayerless singing cannot impact the heart for God. Prayerless saints do not worry Satan one iota. A praying believer will accomplish great things for God because prayer produces power. 
Prayer brings brokenness. Prayer opens the door for us to obey the Word of God. Prayer brings a manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God. Prayer creates spiritual sensitivity. Prayer brings physical and spiritual health. Prayer empowers the church. Again, our greatest need is Lord. Teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. I don't know if you know this song or not. Maybe, Caleb, if you can find the music this week, I'd, I'd love for us to, to learn this. And it just disappeared, but here it is. Teach me to pray, Lord. Teach me to pray. This is my heart cry day unto day. I long to know thy will and thy way. Teach me to pray, Lord, teach me to pray. Living in thee, Lord, and thou in me. Constant abiding, this is my plea. Grant me thy power, boundless and free, power with men and power with thee. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In just a moment, your pastor is going to come and conclude the invitation, but just I want to ask you this morning, are you guilty of not availing yourself of the most powerful resource that God has given us? Sometimes we try to figure out things our way. Sometimes we try to seek counsel from men, and, and that's not bad. But we ought to go before the throne of grace first and foremost and mostly. Maybe there have been times in your life when there was a more passionate desire and more passionate walking with God. But maybe that's waned a little bit, and that's why we need revival. That's why we need that reawakening. That's why we need that refreshing. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, I would ask you during this time of invitation that you would do business with God. It's not about doing business with one of us, but it's about doing business with God. Obeying where that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has put His finger on something in your life. Allow Him to work in your midst for His glory. Heavenly Father, pray that You would teach us the importance, the priority and the power of prayer this week. Where we have been guilty of prayerlessness, pray that you would convict us. Help us to repent. Help us to determine by your grace that we're going to learn, we're going to grow in this discipline of prayer. And Lord, would you fill Calvary Baptist Church with prayer warriors whose lives are impacted, families are impacted, this church is impacted, this community is impacted because of a commitment, a recommitment to fervent, effectual prayer of your righteous people. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor. We'll begin a hymn of invitation. This altar is open. Are you going to pray? Or are you not going to pray? That is the question. Those of you who need to use the pew to come forward, there's some room on this front row. Will we be people of prayer? Or are we just going to keep on living without praying? teach us to pray. Someone 
said that our Christian life is our prayer life. If it's true, we're only spending minutes a day. We don't have much of a Christian life. God, forgive me. And I believe the kind of prayer our brother's talking about. I appreciate intercessory prayer, and we need it. We're talking about the kind of prayer that nobody else but God knows that you're doing. I'm talking kind of the prayer where you go and tell somebody, I prayed for you today. I'm glad we're doing that. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about making a prayer list as good as that is. We're talking about talking to God. Have a relationship with the Lord. That kind of prayer can only exist between a person that knows the Lord and is part of God's family. going to do that if you're not saved. Do you know the Lord? Today is the day of salvation. And we as believers want to cultivate this. Another verse while the Lord speaks. self to pray is God still working in your heart I know I just hits me right in the heart if I'm not praying I'm not living for God if I'm not praying I'm not living for the Lord Boy, you're talking about just uh, wasting an opportunity and wasting a life. I don't want to do that. Father, we come to you humbled by the truth of, of our prayerlessness. And uh, Lord, I pray that we could arrive where the disciple arrived there in Luke 11. Lord, teach us to pray. Help me to want to, Lord. Help me to want to pray. Lord, help me to want to spend time with you. Lord, let, please let me see the, the sin in my life and the frustrations and the difficulties. Just, Lord, help me to see those, help those things to drive me to you and not to draw me away from you, Lord. And I just pray you'd help me to live for you, live in your presence in the place of prayer and the spirit of prayer. I pray that would be the testimony of every believer gathered here. And I pray for those in this room that still don't know you as their Savior. Lord, I, be I believe you're tuned in to your creation and the, the people you've created, but they cannot enter into a prayerful, a pleasingly prayerful relationship with you without having salvation. I pray that people would know that. Lord, just guide us, Lord. Help us to know your way. Thank you for using our brother today, and I pray that you would do that again throughout this week as we give you opportunity to work in our hearts through the truth of your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'll ask our ushers to make ready. This is our habit. When we have a guest speaker, we give an offering, a love offering to help them, and we'll do that at the end of each service. And uh, our men will do that. You're welcome to give in the form of cash if you're like me. And about the one place you write a check is at church. You could do that as well. Make it out to Calvary Baptist Church, and we'll make sure... It gets given to our brother here, and we'll collect that throughout the week. And I'm glad that we're here at this meeting. So I want you to be a part of it. I want you to enter into all of it. And we want God to have his way. And uh, let's pray together as we receive this. And uh, so if you're not prepared to give in either way, you certainly can go online and give and designate that gift. 
at calvarybaptistsmithfield.com. Lord, thank you for allowing us to give, to help the man of God. Thank you for him taking the time to be with us. Pray you'd bless him, and may we be a blessing to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. together please thank you for being here this morning and i'd encourage you again to be back tonight we'll have prayer meetings before the service at six o'clock sharp and so i want you to uh, be in those meetings we'll do that every night half hour before the meeting we'll have prayer we tend to have our prayer rooms as we call them one for men and one for ladies and they meet in the other building if you come over that way if that's something you've done regularly you come over that way tonight a little before six we'll get you into the right spots in the evenings that means it would be at 6 30 on monday tuesday and wednesday night and i want you to I want you to be in these meetings just you have an opportunity to, to grow in the lord maybe maybe an unusual way in a very a very um i don't know how you could track it it's very tangible to grow in the lord this week in the effort of prayer uh, sometimes we come into these meetings and we figure, what, what will be the result of these meetings? I think we will see it very readily in our own lives, uh, whether we're given to prayer to the Lord or whether we're not. And so I believe it will be a different kind of meeting that way. We'll see what God does, and what we'll see is how much you are interested in what God could do in your life. If you have an interest and you have the availability, you ought to be in these meetings this week. And I encourage you to invite others to be with you. The gospel will be clear. It will be available to people, and God will do his work. You be here, invite people to be with you. Let's see how interested we are in what only God can do in our lives and in this church. Your attendance will be that thermometer, that barometer of that. That's exactly the truth of it. So I encourage you to go after the Lord with all of your heart. Let's bow for another word of prayer as we're dismissed. Thank you for being here today, especially if you're visiting. Look forward to greeting you at the door. I want you to, to know we're seeking the Lord, and we're serious about it. We love serving the Lord. We have a good time. Well, it's, it's something to be serious about and to give ourselves to and thank God for the opportunity. As we bow this morning, I ask Brother Mike, if you would, to lead us in prayer. Thank you.